Hey everybody, Ren here. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Really happy to have you here. If you're listening and haven't subscribed, listen to the story. If you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button for me. Now, let's get to tonight's story. The Mortician's Meal. Written and read by Ren Bryant. The workers at Green Meadow Cemetery were clocking out for the night their minds already drifting to a cold beer and a hot meal. Unbeknownst to them, there was one corpse left behind. A Jane Doe dropped off earlier that day by the police. The mortician left her on the embalming table, cold and stiff as the grave. The embalming room was a nightmare come to life, a place where the dead were made to look almost alive again. A place with scalpels and syringes and grotesque instruments of all kind. The walls were lined with shelves filled with jars of formaldehyde and pickled organs. The air was thick with the sickly sweet scent of death. Except for the mortician, no one wanted to enter the embalming room. Not unless they absolutely had to. And even then, they would do so with a hand over their mouth and nose. The mortician was a strange one, a reclusive fellow who avoided most everyone. That suited the other workers at the cemetery just fine. They nicknamed him the Grinch. To everyone else, the mortician was cold-hearted, mean-spirited, and lacked any sort of empathy. They figured he spent so much time with corpses that he forgot how to properly interact with the living. No one really knew the background of the mortician. Some said he was a war veteran, an army doc suffering from PTSD. Others whispered he was a kook with a twisted fascination with death. Why else would you become a mortician, they would say. In the silence of the morgue, the mortician began his work. His lanky arms moved slow and deliberate, as if he was savoring each moment. He wore a stained lab coat that hung loosely on his bony frame and a pair of thick black gloves that reached up to his elbows. His thinning hair was slicked back with a greasy pomade, and his breath was heavy and labored, as if he was constantly on the verge of a coughing fit. With his scalpel, he carved off a small piece of thigh meat from Jane Doe, a sashimi-sized sliver that he tossed into his mouth like a bird eating a worm. As he savored the taste of human flesh, His sunken and hollow eyes softened, his face relaxed. Rocky Mountain oysters, caviar, balut, sheep brain, roadkill. Every culture has its delicacies, the mortician thought. This was the same. What he did wasn't wrong, not according to the mortician. He was careful with his choice of meat. There were rules to abide by if he didn't want to be discovered. Rule one was tell no one, obviously. Believe it or not, there are forums out there where people discuss eating human flesh. It's hard to keep things secret, even dark, monstrous things. The temptation to talk about the pleasures of the flesh are always only a few clicks away. So rule one, tell no one, even when tempted. Cheek meat is so succulently soft and tender perhaps the mortician's favorite part of the human, but he had to keep his impulses in check. Would a loved one want one last look in the coffin? Would there be some lawsuit causing the body to be exhumed shortly after burial? Imagine the reaction to seeing a chunk of cheek torn out of the corpse, like a vulture picks away at his food. So that's why the mortician had rule two, never consume the ones that would be noticed. The mortician would only eat the unclaimed, the forgotten, the Jane and John Doe's who had no loved ones that worried about them. The sound of a door opening made the mortician turn into a statue, his scalpel raised in front of his face as if he was conducting an orchestra. It was late, much too late for any of the cemetery staff to be around, yet he clearly heard the latch on the front door of the morgue. Dear old Jane would have to wait. The mortician decided he couldn't risk being seen with the corpse. He would store Jane for the night and return to his work tomorrow. There were two meat lockers, 
the official one, the one that anyone could enter, were bodies laid under a white drape on metal tables and the temperature was kept to a preservable 36 degrees. Then there was the mortician's locker, the one he made himself, an offshoot of the official refrigerator, tucked away behind a hidden door that was always blocked by a dead body under a mortuary drape. This refrigerator was taller rather than wider, tall enough to allow his bodies to hang on meat hooks. Like beef, the bodies would age, refining their succulent flavor. After a few days, there would be a sweet quality to the meat. A few days longer, and one would find hints of chestnut and a deeper, more complex flavor profile. If the mortician had enough supply, his preferred amount of aging was 21 days, at which point the fat would marble into something that melted into one's mouth like warm butter. Of course, it all depended on how good the refrigeration was. Because he was stealing refrigeration from the morgue, his hidden room would never stay the right temperature for long-term storage. Up top, where the hooks were located, the temperature would sometimes rise to 50 degrees in the summer, making the meat rot quicker than he could consume it. It also gave the entire morgue an overpowering stench of rot and decay. But the smell kept people away, so the mortician didn't mind. To him, it was the sweet smell of his next meal. It's open, Alex said, his eyebrows raised in a can't-believe-my-luck delight. Alex wasn't sure the door would be open. He hoped that it would be, prayed that it would be, and he got lucky. Alex opened the door, exposing a dimly lit interior, illuminated only by a flickering light of a few fluorescent bulbs. The morgue was located in the back of Green Meadows Cemetery past the final row of old graves. Green meadows went from new to old, new graves in the front, graves dating back to the 1800s in the back. The morgue was semi-subterranean, built into a berm that went along the entire length of the cemetery on the backside. Its walls were made of cold gray stone that seemed to absorb the surrounding darkness. There were two doors, one to the crematorium, on the left, and one to everything else, on the right. He chose the one on the right. His destination was the embalming room. Paige squished her face and looked at her best friend Kimberly for advice. Kimberly shrugged. This is creepy, Paige told Alex. I don't know. Come on, it will be fun, Alex joked. Ghoulish fun. He raised his arms like a zombie then entered the morgue. Alex and Paige were a thing. Well, Alex wished they were a thing. They dated their freshman year in high school. It was the first time either of them dated someone, but it didn't last long. Paige said he was too immature, and she thought he still was. Alex, however, never lost feelings for Paige. He loved her then, and he loved her now. He thought it was the same with her, too, because... Sometimes she would give him looks in a certain way. For Paige, however, she wasn't looking at him in any certain way but her normal way. Yet they remained good friends, and Alex thought now that they were seniors, maybe they should give it a go again. Hence, Alex trying to be Mr. Cool Guy by scaring the girls out of their wits. Alex heard some stuff about the morgue from the father of his buddy, Thomas Trent. Thomas's dad worked at the cemetery and says the morgue was super creepy. He said there's stuff in glass jars on the wall, stuff like hearts and intestines. Alex thought it would be just the thing to creep the girls out, maybe make Paige jump into his arms and bury her face against his chest. Then he could squeeze her and pull her tight and be the protector. And if he could pull that off, she'd be his for sure. Oh my God, what's that smell? It smells like something died in here, Paige said as she covered her nose and mouth with her t-shirt. Embalming fluid and death mixed into a pungent stench that brought tears to Paige's eyes. At the end of the hallway, a light was on. Alex walked towards it, leading the group down the narrow industrial corridor. The smell got worse with each step, 
and Alex and Kim pulled up their shirts like Paige. I don't know, Paige said. It was her common refrain. Anytime she didn't know what to say but had thoughts on her mind, she'd say, I don't know, letting the words trail off into space. Alex ducked his head inside the door. It was the embalming room, the place he wanted to show the girls. You gotta see this, he said, walking in. The girls followed. The room was better than Alex could have imagined, better than anything Thomas's dad talked about. In the middle of the room was a stainless steel table, a drain in the middle leaving no doubt what it's used for. Laying next to it was a cart of various sharp medical instruments and power tools. Things like scalpels and a drill and a saw. The table was stained with blood and other bodily fluids, and the walls were adorned with shelves upon shelves of glass jars filled with organs and specimens preserved in formaldehyde. The girls shuddered as they imagined what horrors must have occurred in the room. Perfect, Alex thought. In the corner of the room stood a large walk-in refrigerator, with its door slightly ajar, revealing rows of metal trays filled with bodies wrapped in white sheets. The low hum of the refrigerator's compressor seemed to echo through the room, as if it was the only sound in an otherwise silent world. Suddenly a loud noise like a foot stomping caused them all to jump. They spun around to see the mortician standing in the doorway, a sly grin on his face, his black work gloves still on his hands. You shouldn't be here, the mortician said. This is my domain, my kingdom of the dead. The girls let out a collective scream, but Alex managed to maintain his composure. We're uh, here to identify a body, Alex said, trying to sound confident. Thomas told them to say that if he got caught. The mortician chuckled. Ah, I see. Well, I'm afraid you're too late for that. The body's already been claimed. Alex wasn't expecting that answer. Not that he had an answer in mind, but that wasn't it. He didn't know what to say, so instead, he said, What do you mean? The mortician stepped closer and the girls backed away in fear. Alex took a step back too. I mean the person who wanted the body took it away earlier today. There's nothing left to identify. The mortician smiled, his grin going ear to ear, exposing mottled teeth. It was a lie, of course. If they were here for Jane Doe, which the mortician didn't think possible since he knows he would have been called in advance, they weren't going to have her. The woman's flesh tasted too sweet, like plums or red currants. Getting bodies that tasted so good was exceptionally rare and the mortician was not giving her up. Alex thought something was off about the mortician. He couldn't tell exactly what it was, but something about that smile, something about those recessed eyes, or maybe it was the black gloves and how the mortician wrapped his fingers together. Whatever it was, Alex knew they needed to leave. Well, we should be going then, Alex said, gesturing for the girls to follow him. As they turned to leave, the mortician let out a low chuckle. Oh, but I don't think you'll be going anywhere. Suddenly the lights went out, plunging the room into complete darkness. The girls screamed as they heard the sounds of the mortician's footsteps approaching them. Elks fumbled around in his pocket, searching for his phone. He finally found it and turned on the flashlight, illuminating the room once more. But the mortician was nowhere to be seen. The three huddled together, their nerves making everything in their bodies race. This was not what Alex had in mind by scaring the girls. Now it wasn't Paige holding him, but everyone holding each other, shaking in fear. With the tiny spotlight from Alex's phone, they carefully made their way back down the dark hallway. After a few steps, they heard the slow sound of something dragging on the ground behind them. 
Alex shined the flashlight towards the noise, revealing a trail of blood leading towards them. Paige let out a stifled scream, covering her mouth with her hands. Guys, we need to move faster, Alex whispered urgently, pulling the girls along with him. We have to get out of here before it's too late. The three took off in a sprint and came crashing together and tumbling to the floor, having run into the front door. It didn't budge. The mortician had it locked tight. Slow, deliberate footsteps echoed off the hallway walls. The sounds of dragging provided macabre background music. Help! Someone help us! Paige screamed, pounding on the door with all her might. But there was no response. Only the sounds of the mortician footsteps growing louder and closer. They could hear his breathing now, ragged and uneven. It sounded like he was enjoying this, relishing in their fear. The mortician stepped through the darkness and into the phone spotlight. He was holding a bloody scalpel, his eyes gleaming. The dragging sound stopped when he stopped. It was the naked body of a woman, Jane Doe, which he was dragging by her long black hair. I have a special treat for you tonight, the mortician said. Fresh meat straight from the cemetery. He sliced off a chunk of Jane Doe's shoulder, slurped it down, and smiled. The three high schoolers stood frozen in place, unable to move or make a sound. Even Alex, who stood in front of the girls to protect them, didn't move as the mortician came for his neck with the scalpel, taunting him to do something, something so he could slice him wide open. The mortician chained the teenagers to the radiator on the wall outside the meat locker. He left the doors open, both the official refrigerator and his unofficial one, making the students both shiver and gag as the reek of putrefaction wafted through the morgue. Alex stood up, acting all tough as he pulled the chain on his wrist and made the metal clank against the radiator. Paige and Kimberly sat together and hugged each other, cowering in fear and crying fat, sloppy tears. The mortician paid them no mind as he carved around Jane Doe's knee joint and removed the bottom half of her leg. The fluid in Jane had been removed by this point, so the blood was minimal. The mortician let out a deep sigh at the wonderful sight before him. The meat under the flesh was deep red, and it couldn't get much fresher. Fresh steak always put a smile on his face. The mortician grabbed Jane Doe's leg by the shin and thrust her toes into the faces of the teenager. Who wants a nibble? The mortician said playfully as he poked their faces with the toes. The teenagers winced and jerked their heads back, trying to avoid being touched by the corpse. What's wrong, not hungry? Come on, maybe just a pinky toe. The mortician zeroed in on Kimberly, bent down and put his face equal to hers. He leaned forward, his cancerous breath making Kimberly melt. With his free hand, he wiped back his hair, smearing a streak of blood on his creased forehead. You look hungry, he said as he squeezed Kimberly's cheeks together so hard they went white. Open up. He stuck a long black rubber-coated finger in her mouth like a fish hook and pulled Kimberly's mouth open, yanking down so hard on her jaw that Kimberly moaned. Eat it, he said as he put Jane's toes in her mouth shoving it down far enough to trigger Kimberly's gag reflex. Chunky brown vomit purged from Kimberly's mouth, splattering on the floor, her friends and the mortician. The mortician looked down at his lab coat, which was wet with a new stain. He let out a deep labored breath and shook his head, then stood up, turned away, and put down Jane's leg on the metal table. In normal circumstances, the mortician would find out more information about the people he would consume. Would they be noticed? Were they important enough to be missed more than a typical missing person case? But tonight was no normal circumstance, and the mortician skipped right over rule two. 
With the vengeful cry from the depths of hell, the mortician turned with a sawzall screaming at full power in his hands. He came straight at Kimberly. She didn't even have a chance to move before it came down on top of her head, the saw blades slicing through her skull like pumpkin pie. Shards of brain and bone flew to heaven and made clinking noises as they bounced off the jars of body parts and fluids stored in jars on the wall. A firehouse of gore exploded from Kimberly's head, covering Alex and Paige in red. There was so much blood that if they opened their mouth to scream, it flood into their throats. One of Kimberly's eyeballs popped from its socket and skidded to a stop on the floor. It wasn't until the mortician got to Kimberly's neck that he stopped the brutality. He put down the saw, rubbed the blood off his face, and smiled at his handiwork. Kimberly's bisected head lay on each shoulder. Paige and Alex were a mess of blood. Bits of brain clung to their faces. When Paige opened her eyes, the white contrast made them look like two Texas full moons. When she saw Kimberly's corpse leaning against her, blood burping onto her shoes, her breath became twitchy sips. I love the smell of meat, the mortician said, licking his lips. Alex put his arm around Paige, hugging her tight. Kimberly's blood dripped off his arm. You weren't supposed to do that! Alex yelled at the mortician. He puffed out his chest, trying to ooze as much 17-year-old masculinity as he could. The mortician turned and went back to working on Jane Doe. Paige was inconsolable. Her tears turned the red blood on her face pink then made little splashes as they hit the blood on the floor. She had been best friends with Kimberly. They met in freshman year over a mutual love of 90s boy bands and had been joined at the hip ever since. Paige's distant eyes came back to reality and she turned to look at Alex. What do you mean not supposed to do that? She said. Alex dropped his arm off Paige's shoulder. His head went to attention like a dog hearing a whistle. Uh, nothing, he just shouldn't have killed her like that. Paige wiped the snot from her nose. Except, that's not what you said. You didn't say you shouldn't have killed her. You said he wasn't supposed to do that. Same thing, Alex said, his eyes blinking rapidly. Paige stared at Alex, her face showing no emotion. No. It's not, she said. Oh, bloody hell, the mortician said. His back turned to the teenagers as he made fillets from dear old Jane. In slow motion, he stabbed his scalpel towards Alex without even looking at him. Your little boyfriend there paid me to scare you. Paige's eyes narrowed, but stayed locked onto Alex's. Oh, don't pretend, lover boy, the mortician said. The gig is up. Fun and games are over. Now it's time to eat. Alex's Adam's apple bounced in his throat as he took a big gulp of nothing. Alex, is this true? Paige asked. Uh, I... Damn it! Kim is dead! Look at her fucking body! Look at it! Her head is split in two! We're chained up like dogs and we're next! He wasn't supposed to! Alex blurted. He was only supposed to scare you, to make it seem like I was your protector. He's a fucking cannibal, Paige yelled. You're going to protect me from a cannibal? I didn't know, Alex said. He was only supposed to scare you. The mortician laughed a breathy laugh that made his bloody lab coat shake. He took a bite out of Jane Doe's bicep and turned to show the teens her half-masticated remains. It was Thomas Trent's dad, Alex said. He works here. He said the place was creepy, so I made a deal with him. I paid him to keep the door to the morgue open. He was supposed to give half the money to the mortician so he could scare you and Kim. I thought I could pretend to be brave, that we could then be boyfriend-girlfriend, that you would love me. Alex sat down cross-legged on the ground, in a pool of Kimberly's blood. He buried his face in his hands and broke down crying. 
his first tears of the evening. I didn't know he was a cannibal, Alex said as he wiped away tears. I didn't know. Paige was horrified. She couldn't believe Alex would think of such a plan. She knew he was immature, but this was beyond the pale. Kimberly's dead. They're next. Anger boiled within her. Enough chit-chat, the mortician said. It's time to eat. He revved his sawzall and flexed it in Paige's face. She was so mad and shocked at what Alex had done that she didn't even flinch as he got within inches of her nose. Do you know who my dad is? Paige said, matter-of-factly. The mortician stopped buzzing his saw and looked at Paige quizzically. What is your last name? The mortician asked. Khalid, Paige said, as in representative Khalid. Rule two, the mortician thought, never consume the ones who would be noticed. The mortician rubbed his pointy chin through his glove. He blinked a bit and stared off into the distance. Paige leaned over and whispered into his ear. He smiled. She smiled. Then she was unchained. As Paige walked down the hallway towards the front door, the screams of Alex echoed throughout the mortuary. Paige thought of Kimberly and the good times they had together, how she was the one that originally told Paige to dump Alex. She was right about the guy all along, that he was no good. If you only knew, Paige said as a single tear dripped down her cheek. The mortuary door swung closed to the sounds of a saw revving. Then Alex's screaming stopped.